one time, he says. And at that time, he wasn't uh, telling me much of timing because he himself wasn't interested in that. But he knew that if the body didn't eliminate from what was put in, it was clogging up. I later discovered the time cycles right, in my own body and then tested it and worked with other people. But then I realized that your body must stay on time to function. And it's easy to get proper bowel movements from eating within the growth cycle of the food. Because you eat the fruits and nuts in the morning and uh, prunes will clean you out from what you had last night or yesterday. And then the lunchtime, well, you eat certain foods there and drink the juice, the grape juice, they'll clean out again. And at night time you drink the pineapple, that cleans out. So you're always going to have a release going through. Nature placed it there for you to release. So, so, as far as eating meat or not eating it, you must know your blood type. When you know your blood type, then a little, and there's only a certain time where that little is ideal. Usually you'll find people invite you to go out. If you're sticking close to solar way of eating within the light cycle, they never invite you to go eat the outer cycle only around the lunar time. I came here just when full moon was almost uh, tapering off, right? Mm -hmm. So I could indulge with a piece of fish or a shrimp or something, and this would taper off the chemistry in my body. But over the years, I've observed that, that around the full moon time, three days before the full moon, the day of the full moon, three days after the full moon, within that period, I would use a little of the animal product, the egg, or the flesh, or a little of the alcohol, to stabilize the acid chemistry, otherwise I get too alkaline. Now, when that period is passed, and the body is stabilized again, it go a full month without having to rely on it. But it it's not something I crave. There's a vast difference of craving that will give, pull your conscious energy down and your conscious awareness of internal qualities down. It's when you overindulge. If you take a little for the medicinal value, it doesn't have that. It's what we call homeopathic medicine. Homeopathy is a form of medicine which goes like this. It takes a thief to catch a thief. And the other type of medicine where for every disease you must have a countermeasure, that's a policeman to catch a thief. So orthodox medicine is like the policeman catching the thief. Unorthodox medicine is the uh, thief to catch a thief. So your body is set up this way. That a little is valid, too much no good, and not all is no good either. So you must know your blood type. And this has nothing to do with being religious or otherwise. This strictly has to do with your health functioning to make a livelihood and take care of your obligations in this world. Forget that uh, whatever religious affiliation you have, it has nothing to do with food. Food will make you more appreciative of what affiliations you have, but get healthy first. If you're healthy, <laughs> all the things will be all right. Every church will be an open door of God. So don't, it's like one man said to me, he says, uh, they didn't let me in church today because uh, I was too uh, dirty. And so I said, well, it's too bad. He said that night uh, he had a dream and Jesus came knocking at the door. And he said, what are you crying about? They didn't let you in the church this morning. He said, they didn't let me insist they built it. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, is what we eat, you feel. <laughs> don't have nothing to do with religious attitudes. But nevertheless, we become more spiritual and religious-minded 
our values are modeled improve a lot when you start looking at the nutrition in its proper perspective. Yeah. What if you uh, go to visit your relatives in Minnesota and you're on the solar diet and then for a whole week they're giving you all these different foods mm -hmm. and you, you don't know what to say to you? Do you just say, I'm sorry, but, uh, you don't you have three choices. <laughs> it's a yes, no, and a maybe no. <laughs> See, uh, you're asking the wrong man and who had been through this already. And the, the answer is yes, no, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes, I may hurt their feelings by saying I don't touch the stuff because I'm following a certain way of eating. That's the straight, blunt truth of it. No, I will not hurt their feelings. I can excuse and create a statement that's I'm on the medical observation, and my doctor doesn't allow me to use these type of stuff for the time being. You don't mind if I don't touch it. Then they accept that. That's just a facade or a cosmetic con conversation so they don't pressure you. And maybe by knowing the various juices of the day from the various fruits, you can innovate a stabilization while visiting with them. So in the morning they may give you bacon and eggs to eat. Okay, eat the bacon and eggs, but ask them for some kind of uh, apple juice or apple cider vinegar and mix it up with the, uh, they take two teaspoons of the apple cider vinegar and two teaspoons of honey and eight ounces of distilled water and just drink it. And that will stabilize that instead of hurting their feet. Everybody's got some vinegar in the house, or you can go out and buy it yourself and keep it in your travel bag. So that way you don't feel uncomfortable, and you're not hurting their feelings because they're inviting you out to the goodness of their heart. And maybe, another thing is, you can be tested kinesiologically and find that the food will knock out your energy in the morning but if you pray over it and suddenly you put it in your hand and check it, you suddenly see that the energy is holding. We have done this many a times. That's why you pray over the food, you change the kinesiological reaction for the time lapse while you use it. And therefore it will not knock out your mechanism, it will not uh, be a toxic reaction, and you can pass through the whole day without being affected by it. So prayer over a meal has its value now. In medical profession, they may say yes, and also you may be hypnotizing yourself or you're setting up a placebo effect. Whatever it is, you want to label it just for the sake of not hurting their feelings, use it, and it's valid. As far as your health is concerned, it will cope with it. But if you don't do something to nullify its effect on you, the biological effect will take place in your own enzymes. You see? The reason being is that uh, if you call me a son of a gun, before I hear it, you would be toxified by saying it. And I show you how that is possible. That's why they say it is not what you put in your mouth that defiles you, but what comes out of your mouth defiles you. Uh, you have to think to call me a son of a gun, and you have to use your own vocal cords to say it. By the same token, you're going to swallow your saliva back. And they're toxic with the intent of what you want to label me. And therefore, your tummy <laughs> and hydrochloric is knocked out. And we can measure that and see it and then take a test and see how high that the toxin went up in that split second. And I may not even hear, I may be deaf to you. <laughs> you see? And, uh, oh, it may peter in or uh, slowly at some moment in time. Uh, well, I feel kind of icky about this guy. I don't know what he's doing. But, but that will come after. But the worst effect would be in you, the person that's doing it. And we did many tests like that, you see, to find out what we do to ourselves. So, again, what you say over the food can be a way of neutralizing it. Most doctors are using those methods not to. But if you go and you know what to do, then you're not threatened. 
There's a story that goes like this. It occurred with Yogananda one time. They said that the woman and Yogananda and some friends were going to a meeting, and when the meeting was over, they stopped in a restaurant to eat. It was a Chinese restaurant. And they asked for chow mein, vegetable chow mein. But it so happened there was a mix-up in the kitchen, as I call it, the comedy of errors. They brought the food, and in the woman's plate who was ordering, there was chicken. Well, she got so upset to see the chicken, and then she stuck the fork in, into the food. <laughs> and she was going to berate the, the waiter so bad that the Yogananda looked up and said, Sister, it's bad enough that the chicken is dead, but that karma is over. But the worst karma you are making now is berating your brother, <laughs> who is God in the flesh. Maybe he's testing you. So sit up and eat the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That's worse karma. <laughs> this karma, the chicken, his karma is done finished. He had to come and be cooking a pot. <laughs> and happened to be in your play, but you see what I mean? So again, the attitude and knowing what to do after, your body will phase it off. So a little. And if you took a little wine, Again, for your stomach's sake, because there is no way your friends are going to know what you eat. And they try their best, they want to be like sociable. Then take a little wine, and that will phase out the effect. So I find sometimes I get invited out and I don't want to touch the product. And so they say, I say, they say, would you like a little uh, liqueur? I say, yeah, it's evening time. So I say, okay, I'll take a little tequila. Fine, and that makes them happy, they don't feel threatened, and they invite you. But that stabilizes the stomach. And then you go back, and your body is normalized, and you meditate again. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that you don't feel threatened, and you know what to do. If you don't know what to do, then that's the problem. But if you know what to do, then a master is only a person who knows timing for every single thing in this world around him. He is a master of time. He is the final touch to the machinery. That's why he's called a master. He knows exactly to make the final touches, what makes the thing function right. So we are all masters of ourselves as we become conscious of the time. So don't be threatened though. I've seen where people got so uptight, and I used to be like that too, wouldn't touch nothing. And it wasn't helping me because it knocked out my chemistry too. To be 100% deviant or 100% non deviant was not, it's knowing how to function in it. Now, there's a difference between asked and offered or go craving it. Uh, and you say, I can't do without this and I can't do without that, then you're really uh, off time. But the funny thing is this, you'll never find somebody who is addicted to anything, use that thing in its right time. They're always using it in the wrong time. That's why they're addicted to it. And they can't uh, stop craving it because they're consuming it or using it in its wrong time. The addiction level is always found in the wrong time. The allergic level is always found in the right time. By the same token, we use that method now to take care of a lot of people who drink, smoke, or on drugs. It stabilize their addictive time or their allergic time. And they get off it. They get well. So that is showing us more and more that the timing is more important over the type and then the quantity is next. Once you know the timing, then the quantity and type comes next. But if you don't know the timing, you're going to go off and then you're going to hurt yourself more. Everything is here to be used. Too much no good. 
I'm not talking about, but but timing is important. Any other question? Yes. About the pineapple juice, is canned pineapple juice all right? Or fresh? It's much better if you can get it. If you can get fresh, good and fine. If you can get fresh, use if they uh, can. But they do make canned pineapple juice now without any additives to it. It's just plain juice. And I drink it with a little of uh, aloe vera juice because aloe vera juice is very important to your body, especially at night. It stabilizes the major organs of your body at night, which you do need to stabilize your gallbladder, your liver, and the large intestine for the morning the disposal. Also, it's ideal for the rectal area of the body and the genital area of the body that if there's any uh, disturbance of, uh, in those areas, it will start clearing it up. And it's good for the lungs too. So it's one an unusual product, yet it's a night plant. It's from the bromelia family. It, and it's when you mix it with the pineapple juice at night and drink it. We use it a lot in our clinic for people who have a lot of intestinal problems. And, uh, and they have, uh, they don't know how to correct it, so we make them drink the pineapple juice with it at night to correct their intestinal problems. But it's ideal at night. And if you take it in a can, look for the one that's just plain, there's nothing added to it. Or do I stick it? Mm -hmm. What portion of the pineapple and aloe vera? Half and half. Yeah. Um, what are your feelings about the, the preventative measures that they take with infants as far as immunization and mostly immunization? So I've, I've already. I have pretty strong feelings about You mean vaccinations? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, vaccinations are, there is a yes and a no and a maybe <laughs> game. <laughs> it's when they give it to you and what you do after to help you not uh, deprive the immune system or make it reliant on the product. It's again you have to know. I do not prevent a person from going to the vaccination because the school is not going to admit you in the public without it. But at the same time, I tell the person what to do for the, the baby or the child and then what to do after the vaccination is given. You see, they're only vaccinating it for certain type of illnesses and uh, you can build up the immune level so that when the vaccination is given, it uh, doesn't have uh, any real re high reactive action to the system because the immune level is high enough and it'll cope with it. So, it, and at the same time, if you put in certain foods during that time, the vaccine would tend to be less reactive or toxic to the system. It'll phase off and go out quicker. But that doesn't make the child less immune. It just uh, reassures its immune system. But when you don't know, then you can feel threatened by it. What, what kind of measures can you take into Well... Uh, should you wait longer rather than... No, if you're going to take the child for a vaccination, uh, make sure that there's no milk products in his stomach. Including mother's milk? Well, mother's milk is alkaline. Cow's milk is acid. The Eastern people don't drink cow milk as we thought at one time, they drink yak milk, buffalo milk, and goat milk. All these milk are alkaline. Or well, we use the term, they drink milk. Why can't we drink milk? Or how come they don't have the problem? We have the, it's because the milk, the, is not cow milk. Now, a Hindu will drink more milk uh, than any person I know of. <laughs> but uh, the moment he drinks cow milk, he gets sick. But put him back in his environment and let him drink his buffalo milk or his yak milk or his goat milk, he doesn't have the lung problems or the mucus build up. Because that milk is alkaline, like the human milk. See, the human milk is alkaline. In fact, the donkey, the antelope, 
then the goat in that order of alkalinity the, the, donk, the antelope or the donkey is more like human the goat is like human but it does have a residual action and then the cow is next for that of large quantity for production but the reaction is, is acidity is high. See? But as far as uh, human milk is concerned, or goat milk is concerned, it's alkaline. The yak milk, buffalo milk, they're all alkaline. So they don't uh, have the problem. Would that be the that's one thing you don't put in before the vaccine. Don't put milk into the child's mechanism. And then if you, after the vaccine is administered, you can wash the uh, vaccine area with a little aloe vera or apple cider vinegar. So it doesn't have the reaction on the mechanism as severely as it would in another person. But this would, would uh, satisfy the mechanism of the body. The aloe vera will stabilize it. Apple cider vinegar will stabilize it. I know a lot of people who have gone through that. Um, they're okay now. They don't <coughs> have the problem. They have to go through it for the sake of school. But you don't, uh, if you don't know, it's different. When you know what to do, it's, you know, that's in your favor. My tendency was to not want to give them a demonization at all. But you see, sometimes uh, if the person is not immunized and then there is a condition in the school and uh, again, if the child is not eating properly, he may be more susceptible. That's what you have to consider to, you see. It's a whole lot better to have the immunization and understand what to do and then watching the nutritional uh, balancing, then you wouldn't have the problem because then to not immunize the child, and then if the child is eating a lot of French fry and cokes and uh, ice cream and different things, and it gets sick, then it's <coughs> not a practical condition either. See? But if uh, it's uh, taken care of by not uh, letting it have any milk products when it's going to be immunized, and then cleansing the area, then it's no problem because when it, the condition comes up, it's not going to be affected. But that will not drop down its immunity, it will keep it immunity up. Um, is, is there a book or, or some literature with these ideas that you can pass on to others? Or is this totally unique with, with you? Isn't this sort of the oriental way, the uh, type of thing? Yeah, those who are being initiated will have a copy of it. It's going to be given to the initiates here. It's something I've done a long time, but it's agreed that uh, at the initiation, for initiates, they'll have the copy of it. Right now we're working on a more technical book with all the research in it. We serve a lot of people. But so far, what we have available will be given to the initiate because the initiate needs it for his own life to stay healthy. It's not uh, the general public have access to all type of nutritional intake. We're not here to compete with them. The reason why we don't uh, put it on the shelves of the is because unless you are ready for solar nutrition, it wouldn't make any sense to you. You see? And it's, it's a way of life that you is natural be there, but you have to try all the other methods. And like tonight, uh, we're having supper, and the young kids are talking what they would love to eat. And the parent would like them to eat solar. But I said, no, don't force the kid to be solar because that's not good. It takes 30 years to muck it up, <laughs> and 30 years to clean it up. 
-hmm. And the body is designed to handle every type of concoction for 30 years. You see, disobedience is necessary for evolution. And if you're going to try to restrict the person to stay healthy from the start, you wouldn't know what it is to be sick. And one of the rules of solar nutrition is you must eat to get sick in order to eat not to get sick. <laughs> Nobody likes that, but that's the way nature's got it. And if you look at a child, uh, the first thing it does when it's born, and you leave it in the corner, it will reach out for something like this. It's always putting something in its mouth because that's the way they learn. Now, you can try to insulate them against that, but again, they will deviate. But they have to learn through some illness in the body and then turn to mom and dad for direction. Then mom and dad may give them some uh, way to get well with the doctor. But eventually, they will, it will ingrain in their consciousness that the things they are doing are not so healthy. Then they quit it. At that time, they have got the exposure to some of the aches and pains of the body. And then it would be more for them to see. So no, uh, the concept that we're talking of is not something that will take over society. It is when you are ready, it will be there for you. But the parents who are on the path and understand what they're doing to maintain their own in a good, they'll have it to work with. You might talk about the fact that you might have a workshop. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometime uh, when I come back and through this area again, we would like to set up a, uh, a workshop for the uh, group mm -hmm. where we can do a whole... You see, in Houston, we usually have it there once a month, in the last Sunday of the month, and the workshop. And it goes from uh, 11 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And we serve a lunch and a supper. But we work out all the factors of the soil nutrition for the benefit of and the different. But uh, as I say, we could work out something like that in the future. Have a workshop in here. Yeah? Is there a better time during the day to eat for Brewer's yeast is ideal from midday to 6.30 because it's, it's grown, the way it's grown, it's in a light and it's ideal for that time. Night time it itches you, morning time it makes you get upset gas. I used to take it all around the clock and found that in the morning I got gas and night time it creates some more itching and the middle of the day it was valid. And so in the middle of the day I sprinkle it on my food. Now the word brewer's yeast, uh, again, where, what time of day would you drink beer? <coughs> In the middle of the day, because it's made from grain. And the brewer's yeast is used to activate it. So there again, you, it's ideal, and the hops, see that's the time of day to use them. So a glass of beer in the middle of the day is ideal for the body. See, nature has placed everything within their own light cycle to be used, not to be abused. Um, when you're talking about your tequila and your wine at the proper times of day, is that in addition to the food, or is it something that serves the same purpose, like you drink tequila instead of the pineapple juice, or...? No, no. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't know. Like, does it, do they do the same thing, or...? They, so if you're invited you out, let's say you're invited out to, to go out to supper with some right. friends. Tequila just nullifies the bad yeah. stuff you might eat. You're right. Oh. If you're invited out to go out with some friends, mm -hmm. and they all want to go out and eat, somebody say, let's go eat barbecue, somebody say, we eat a seafood or Chinese, but uh, you can select what you want to eat. Now, if you want to eat plain vegetable Chinese food at the Chinese restaurant, they'll serve it to you because that's what you're ordering, yeah. all right? But let's say now you're at a home at a pot where they cook the food and they have the uh, meat already there, please. For your benefit to offset any effect is to have a little tequila for, to release it. Now, if you're going out to a nightclub restaurant, then you can order 
the kilobytes of no, not margarita. Margarita has salt and lime. That's not the that, that concoction is not what we're talking about. Order the natural one or a shot of the tequila and you can order pineapple juice with it. They have it right now. And then you mix the two and drink it at the end of the meal. It's, it's after dinner drink. This settles the stomach. It cleans out whatever you put in there that is maybe toxic. And therefore you wouldn't have the problem. You don't need two or three of it. You just one is just to settle the stomach. Well, I didn't know like, um whether the tequila just nullified it or... No, it's a, it's a, a cleanser. It's a cleanser. You see, now, what, vitamin C is the anti-toxin vitamin. Nature has to provide vitamin C in every period of the day because we're going to eat incorrectly and get toxic. So, vitamin C is found in the citrus fruits in the morning. But if you heat vitamin C, it's destroyed. All right. How is it possible then, can we have vitamin C to take care of an intestinal problem because vitamin C in an orange is good for the lungs and the nasal tract. But you can't heat it. Now, we need vitamin C for an intestinal catar. From an orange, it wouldn't do a single good for it. It wouldn't help it. Nature must provide another source of vitamin C that can withstand heat. So in the tomato, she has placed vitamin C. And you can cook the hell out of a tomato and never destroy the, the vitamin C reaction. Now there is where nature has now made the fantastic uh, quantum leap in her. We were talking the other day about the uh, subatomic particles. <laughs> she has made this quantum phenomena of allowing vitamin C to withstand the heat in the tomato, but not in an orange. Because the orange is for the lungs and the nasal tract. The, the tomato is for the intestinal tract. All right. Now let's say you have a catar in the rectal area or in the genital area. She places vitamin C in a alcohol. Now you can place vitamin C in alcohol, either from the tomato or from the uh, orange juice. It will dissipate. Yet here, the maguey plant that makes tequila, while it's fermenting, contains vitamin C. And no matter how it's fermented to the highest form of alcohol, the vitamin C is found to be stable in it. And it's, here we have vitamin C containing in the alcohol base by nature's own mechanics. For a specific uh, reason, like you have uh, hemorrhoids or polyps, that's where you need a vitamin C. Or you have a rash in the rectal area, you need a vitamin C. There's a, nature has placed it in there. So since C is an antitoxin vitamin in the whole range, now from the source of food, you're getting it. Now if from a coal tar source, this is a synthetic vitamin C. We find that the coal tar source doesn't work good in the morning and doesn't work good at, at night. It only works good in the middle of the day. Because a coal tar is basically a midday uh, substance. And that vitamin C will work good for problems in the day. So, some people, um, on one time I took vitamin C and I crushed it up, put it in liquid and leave it with hydrochloric acid and for 24 hours it never dissolved. Proving that uh, no matter how we take these vitamins in a solid form, they just sit in the stomach and I've had in my own body where I saw that vitamins were extracted by cold irrigation and I had patients who have taken vitamins for a long time for passing it out in chunks. It wasn't being absorbed. The, if it comes in the form of the food, it's absorbed. Sometimes too, you may be toxic and the very food that you're eating, you're not absorbing it in the very food that is supposed to be 
due to the toxicity in the body. So cleaning out the toxins, then the absorption begins again. Yeah. Now you don't have to clean the no, you don't have to. That's only if you've eaten the meat or the fish. Right, if you've eaten the meat or the fish, right, right exactly. But if you, if you hadn't done that, then the other is just something you right. can enjoy, but you don't have to have that. No, no. <laughs> Amidic mm -hmm. dysentery. Amidic dysentery. Uh, we use that for amidic dysentery. Every time my nurse doctor goes down, you know, she goes to Mexico and she has a lot of patients who go down there and get amidic dysentery. And she'd all call me the phone, what do I do with them? I said, Well, you're living in the country where you have the most unique medicine cure for it, but they don't do it. Anytime you leave this country and travel to another country, always drink a little of the local alcohol before you touch any of their food or water. Put that in first. It's a natural immunizing principle for the body. When she did it for herself, her boyfriend and other people, they were convinced. Not too long ago, one was going to Colombia I said to the person, she said to me, what do I do when I get there? I said, on the plane you're going to Colombia, take a little of the local alcohol that we produced in Colombia. Don't touch the food or anything else. Touch, take a little of the alcohol. So it immunizes the area of the colon. Then you can use the food. Before she used to have the problem. When she got there, she'd get sick. This trip, she did exactly what I told her. She got down there and she got a little of the local alcohol. They, they would grow in a, a gay plant there, they make tequila there. She drank that first, then she ate at the regular eating with her friends out from, away from the hotels when most people knew her that she would not go out to eat like that. This trip she went out and ate and came back. And when she came back on the plane, she remembered that she's coming back to the States. Got her a little uh, Jim Beam. You know, <laughs> had a little nip of that, and she was all right in the States again with the local water. <laughs> and she came to visit me at the clinic. She brought me a wonderful present, a gift of her art, and, and was commenting on how the principle works. Whenever you change uh, your areas, the water and the life plants are, very, are all different to your body system. And the immunizing of the colon is a little of the alcohol or local wine. The Chinese play it safe by, or the Japanese play it safe too, by drinking sake, because it's rice. It's a grass, you see. And you can use that morning, noon, and night without any problem, because it's the only neutral uh, uh, food by like that. See, they don't classify rice as a grain. Botanically, it's a grass. It's always been classified as a grass, and its effect is in essence ideal for the colon any part of the world you go you'll find grass and so the sake has been proven to be an ideal immunizer in traveling yeah. when you say a little one jigger <laughs> <laughs> a little is a jigger you know what it, uh, an actual jigger is no. yes. an ounce it's a jigger that's all. One little. Yeah, one jigger. One ounce. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need more than that. It's Otherwise, right. you'll jiggle. <laughs> <laughs> it's one uh, jigger or one ounce. Okay. But it stabilizes the colon, it stabilizes the body. And it's not something to be addictive to because it's not that. It, your body produces the chemical anyhow as an antifreeze. But, uh, you're going to be exposed to all type of uh, food and travel and therefore the adjustment takes too long so to compensate for that one jigger of the local alcohol within the light cycle and your body is stable yeah
Honey is neutral, but you have <coughs> many sources of which honey, and there are times of the day when honey would not be ideal. It's a neutral food, see? But let's say, for instance, you are suffering from a hormone imbalance. And if you were to take the honey with the cocoa bean, you will not help the hormone imbalance, you throw it off more. You have to take the cocoa bean that you make cocoa with the uh, Hershey's cocoa. It grow, the bean grows on a tree. They take the cocoa bean and they powder it, they grind it into powder. Nothing is added to it, so you can buy it in the grocery store. It's called pure 100% cocoa powder or baking cocoa. And you use maple syrup that comes from the maple tree now. Not honey, because honey will act inversely to the hormone. And the cocoa has an ingredient that is uh, known to be a hormone stabilizer for male and female. That's why you find people crave this chocolate and don't know why they're really craving it. It's because as you get older, the hormones are going off their cycles. They're depleting either the male or the female ones, or breaking down too quick. So, you take that with maple syrup, the maple syrup comes from cutting the bark of the tree, the maple tree, and let it leach off the syrup. You combine that with water, and you drink one cup in the morning, and that's a stabilizer. But if you were to use honey with it, it would distort. Now, if you want to use honey on top of your fruits in the morning, that's okay. Now, if you want to use honey in the middle of the day with your uh, <coughs> pastries, so everybody loves to have a piece of cake or pie or something, but then that's the time of day to use it. And it's ideal. Now, if you use it at night, you can use it again with the, some kind of a pastry. Yet, each period of the day, the, the flour that is used can be taken from that growth cycle. Grain, in the middle of the day, all the seven grains can be used for a pastry, as a shell. Uh, rice being a neutral grass, and it uh, makes one of the most ideal pastry so with the you take this the nuts and grind it up with the rice flour and you make your pastry for the morning you can take your potato and mix it with your rice flour and use it for evening time now at my clinic there's a young lady who does all my baking and John has met her she bakes this way for us using the rice and incorporate them for the little time they, for the crust. And when I first met her, she was brought and dumped, literally dumped in the door of the clinic and left there to die. And she was working for the government at the time. And they couldn't find anything wrong with her and they, just, and they couldn't keep her because they, she was, they had no way to validate and they couldn't sign her off for the problem that she was having. She got sick on the job, and the government, she was on the government uh, regulations, and they took her into the hospital. The doctors did all the tests, and they couldn't find a single thing to validate for the illness. First, they checked, and in the first four hours, she showed a high deficiency of minerals in the bloodstream. They didn't give her anything on the observation, and the next four hours, the blood showed a tremendous abundance of those minerals. Then the next four hours, a tremendous deficiency. Well, this went on for about maybe six days, and by that time, the doctor, the whole panel of doctors, they said, they can't find what could be doing this to her body. And there is no way they could keep her, and so they finally, uh, call one of her friends and tell her to take her home because let her go home and die because they don't have any way to stop it. And they couldn't sign her off 
to get compensation because they can't label the illness. Well, this friend called me and he's an initiate and he said, Dhamma, what do I do? <laughs> I said, well, love can work if you want to bring her over and brought her. And so they brought her and I had a pyramid and I put her under the pyramid. And then she barely opened her eyes. I said to her, Ginny, I'm not God, but I can't help you. But I'll tell you what, you can do one of two things. Losers aren't born. Winners are born. You can decide for yourself if you want to stay on the other side of the world or get up and move. She said, huh? <laughs> I said, yeah, you're born a winner. You're a loser. The sperm that got to be the old one is the winner. And it's you right there. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, the moment I hear she's making a connectiveness, I know she's going to pull out. So I leave her there for a while. And after that, I, I hear grumbling sounds and I, I see somebody heading to the door. And, uh, I know she's, let me start working on her. But she triggering her innate qualities to come. And then finally put her on nutrition. First, we had to clean up the colon and then organize her diet for what her problem was to for a long while to get the diet. Now she got well. But she can't work for nobody because nobody hire her and she can't collect compensation because they can't fire her off. <laughs> so, so I said to her, um, you can bake for me. We needed the food in the clinic. To, this is the way you can earn a livelihood. And so I says, uh, but my baking is different. It's based to solar nutritional eating. I love to eat. And I, I don't want to go and buy you know, uh, apple pie made out of uh, holy flour and apples at the same time. So I want to eat an apple pie one mixed with the uh, rice flour. She says, rice flour? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christina has learned a lot of cooking techniques. So they're learning from their own illnesses and what they And if it was say that it was just a fad, you need a nurse like Christina to convince you because when she went back to Mexico and worked among the people there and the problems that she ran into and the way they were eating, she told me not long ago, she says, if anything works, solar nutrition works in the worst areas of the world. She said it works because it has nothing to do with your belief system. It just has to do with the way nature grows things. And she sees it over and over, especially if you work among the natives of Mexico. They come in from all parts of Mexico asking her, like our sister Christine, <laughs> do something for us. And she, she said, oh my God, what do I do? And she said, Adano! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, she calls in the phone one day and says, so, what do I do in a case like this? I said, you see how I work? Apply it. Just apply it. The fruit, the nut, the veggie. And she gets the result and she see it over and over. And but it's, that's where we're testing it more and more. The people who find it very difficult to change You had a question to ask. Margaret? Yeah? yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. As it is difficult to know when to eat what, <coughs> could we try to determine with the pendulum what is good for us and when and what is that has to do with toxicity situation. You can determine that by the pendulum. But again, once it's in the growth cycle, your body will correct itself. It may at first be adverse to the body because of the toxicity. And it may act like a reaction. But 
the body's own enzymes are thrown off because they've eaten incorrectly, they will start correcting themselves again very fast. The reason behind that is like, all right, you wouldn't work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You'll have to have a rest period. Okay. The enzymes are like that. There are many enzymes in your mouth. All don't break down. Uh, let's say... Protein. Though they're designed to break down protein. But protein comes from different sources. Now... Protein from a nut is different from the protein from the meat in its geometry. And the protein from the meat is different from the protein in the egg. Yet the enzymes know by the computing action which one is triggered off to break down nut protein, which one is triggered off to break down animal protein, and which is triggered off to break down egg protein. But well, we didn't know this before. We just assumed that they will do break down protein. That was our assumption. It's until we speak the, the nitty gritty gets into it and then we start to find that these enzymes are very specific in their behavior. And so they will break down the nut protein very easily and they move in mass to break down the nut protein in the morning. Those that are that break down meat protein or egg protein, they are doing what? Sleeping. They are resting. They are in a, a circadian movement of a principle inside. They have a rest period. Because that's not their assigned time. Now, you put in the meat in the morning, the nut protein can't break them. Uh, the, nut, uh, the enzyme that break down nut protein is not going to go handle the, the, the meat protein. Because it isn't organized to work with it. And the one that is organized to work with is sleeping. Mm -hmm. So that protein remains longer in the system and it starts to ferment. We didn't know that years ago, we're discovering it now. That it seemed to be something causing this delayed action and increase in carbon dioxide. It's because the enzymes that normally will break down nut protein can't apply themselves to break down the meat protein. So what they do is simply this. They encapsulate it and put it in a sort of a storage bank, waiting for the other enzymes to come into action a daytime cycle. So as soon as the light cycle of where you are in the location there triggers over to say 11, 30, 12 o'clock, those enzymes start waking up. And they, but then they have to break through the encapsulation that has been placed upon that protein from the other enzymes. And they have to break that down. So they work harder to break it down. And then they work their way through it and uh, dispose of it. You see? Now, if you put egg in, the one that breaks down nut isn't going to do more than encapsulate it. And when the other one wakes up but for the middle of the day, He's going to see this encapsulation, but he is going to do anything more than encapsulate it again because it's not the type that he can handle. Then evening time comes around now, that enzyme wakes up and he has a double encapsulation over the substance to break down. So you find why the pain and the intense gas action, the queasiness goes on in the body. It's that delayed content in the body. Now, a pendulum can tell you, yes, this is good, this is not good for you, and what time. But again, you'll find when it tells it's good for you, it'll still fall within the growth cycle. Nine times out of ten, it all falls in the growth cycle. That's how we used to test it by Tinesia. And Ginny was my very good example, and I have other patients. But in Ginny's case, she was totally knocked out, and her whole electromagnetic field was reversed. And that blows away a lot of people who don't understand the reverse of electrical fields. It's going downwards instead of going upwards. And the, this electrical field is on this side, and this electrical field is on this side, and this one is on the front, 
they're all reversed in her because she was totally thrown out. And so first the, to do with her was to get her to trigger in her brain that she was a winner. The moment you get her to think that way, all these signals have got to start pulling back to move. And therefore, you're, uh, that is why they say when a person has a cancer and if they get pregnant, the cancer goes away. Because the trophoblast cell that becomes cancerous is forced to perform its true function of making a human body and not make a, a malformed organism. See? So therefore it quits being a, a, a performing malformation and starts organizing the work. So she being thrown off in her balance, uh, we had to trigger her to the realization she was a winner. This triggered the body back now, and then the polarity started to come back. But then we had to find the food. In really what she was eating, and she was really eating out of cycle so desperately, and what we found out. <coughs> but then we start tracking it. But you can use the pendulum, what should go in, the quantity, but again, it will fall under the light cycle of its growth, and that would be more obvious. Because you never put in something out of the light cycle, it will not absorb, no matter what quantity it is. It doesn't absorb. It's because you're setting, working with allergic patterns and uh, addictive patterns. And you should never eat one food more than once a day on a real rhythm, unless you're cleaning up the body. You should always eat one food once a day of each cycle. In the case of the cancer stopped by pregnancy, is there a chance that it will start again after the pregnancy? Nine times out of ten, no. One time out of ten, it does. But there again, it has to do with the trauma. Whatever the trauma was that triggered it in the first place, the trauma may still be dormant and may come up again. And that's what you unless the trauma is resolved, it will come back up. But nine times out of ten, it doesn't. The body resolves it. See, the body, uh, it depends on where the uh, cancer is too. If it's in an area where it's supposed to be for reproduction, it never comes back. But if it's in an area not for reproduction, it may come back. So this is what we're looking at again. Yeah. Are most cancers due to trauma? Well, any disease of the body falls under four categories. categories. Trauma, bacteria, breakage, malnutrition, heredity. But heredity is incorporated in the first four. So trauma is the most important one. Then the bacteria will start forming. And then we will lead to a breakage or an injury. And then we will track it down to nutrition that is contributing to it. And so the it's easy to correct the nutrition, correct the breakage and the bacterial condition. It's very difficult to correct the trauma if you don't know what the trauma is. And so that's the one that always eludes us. And that's the one that has to be corrected before the body is functioning properly. And the trauma usually occurs before the injury to the body. Whenever a symptom appears in the body, rest assured the trauma occurred before it. Now it's, there are ways to track it down. And then we can uh, evaluate it and start cleaning it up. But uh, here's a funny phenomenon. Let's say you've been to work and you had an argument with the boss. And the boss happens to be a man. 
invariably the left side of your body is going to break down and invariably you're going to start craving milk products more than usual. If it's a woman that you have the argument with or the trauma, the right side starts to break up. That is very peculiar. It's telling you in its own way how the body is set up. Since we are part ovum, part sperm, part mother part father there are electromagnetic fields connected to the mother and the father and the parts of the anatomy that will give way front or back yeah, this is the thing that we work with all the time and that's in the trauma level yes would it follow that a child born with a physical defect in those parts of their body would have had a trauma or the parents would have had a trauma before it was born? Yes. Like so? Yeah, they do. Remember, nature and all the religious concepts that come down are very scientific if you look at it objectively apart from a religious heritage into a scientific understanding. The scriptural writing would say, I visit the sins of the parents unto the third and fourth generation. I who? I, the creative life, visit means reoccur or come into manifestation. The sins, the deviations of the shocks, more. The word sin simply means missing the mark. It came from an old archer term thousands of years ago, and we got hung up in the uh, dramatics of it and the guilt complexes of it. And in actuality, it was just a term meaning missing the mark, and not focusing correctly. So this particular non-correct focusing would automatically set up reactions. Well, if you take that into consideration, you can't have something without a reaction. And to put it in a, a language of physics, Newton's first law is every action has an equal reaction, right? Take it in a religious context, uh, is what you sow, you reap. That would be valid. The same thing as for every action, there's an equal reaction. You take it now into the oriental concept of causation and effect, they call it karma. The law of cause and effect. There is no effect without a cause. They're all saying the same thing but from different avenues of looking at the truth. In the pregnancy, whatever our grandparents or parents have done and is carried over, we call it heredity. Whatever occurs during the time of the pregnancy, if there's a tremendous argument or shock, that will be carried into the pregnant child during that state. All right. By the same token, there have been researches done, and there have been many experiments done, of educating the child while in the womb. Like in the case of Vyas, who wrote the Bhagavad Gita, dictated the whole thing to the wife, while she was pregnant and sound asleep. And when his son was born, age four, he came right up to the daddy and recited the whole Bhagavad Gita. Now, this is the positive look at the, at the same principle, something constructive versus something destructive in terms of a traumatic condition. We can say that was a super trauma to her, or <laughs> having the, her son confront the dad and repeat the back of a beat. <laughs> <laughs> or, or it could be the opposite. It could have been an argument. 
and then the child comes up with some deviance in the mechanism. Constriction in the throat or arm or something. So you're looking at plus minus situations prior to birth in a pregnancy level. There is where the traumas have their origin most of the time. But the same token, there is a connectedness of the cause effect that since this is not a something from nothing universe, and it's not the first and last time you're here, and we haven't resolved all our obligations or frustrations or we will have to complete them life after life. For example, I may be having an argument with 50 people and I, I did 50 different times in my life. And when I realize the mistake is really mine and I try to correct it and I only correct it at 38, by managing to meet 38 of them and make up for the mistake. The other 12 have already passed on. I'll never get to see them to make up the mistake. But I'll carry the anguish. So that's the connectedness now which we call reincarnation, connectedness. So I have a, again, come into a body form with the unfinished con uh, pattern to try to work it out. So parents who provide that particular mold with those particular consequences or problems that are similar to the one that I haven't resolved, I'm going to end up in that uh, mold to work it out because that's where the, the bill has to be paid. Now today we have similar things like this. You don't have to go to the telephone company to pay a telephone bill. A lot of uh, supermarkets will take your money, right? For the telephone company. So it's the same thing. You don't have to go looking directly for that one person to resolve it. Uh, you're thrown into a body form with certain circumstances of parents who have similar conditions that uh, provide you not to come over there. And there is where the trauma shuns off itself before the birth. Herb tea is very good in the middle of the day, and they have uh, in the morning or at night. Uh, in terms of medicinal accuracy, then that's different. The herbs are of different height. When we're using them for medicinal accuracy and for their problems of the body, we try to stay within their height from the ground up to relation to the light. And we've tracked down also the chemistry is valid. Each light cycle, the same chemical can be found, but in different light cycles and growth cycles, <coughs> height cycles and the different parts of the anatomy to which it reacts best. The reason why we're finding this now is that chronobiology is the emerging science of a lot of uh, unusual phenomena dealing with time and biological reactions, especially when dealing with cancer. We'll come back to cancer. Cancer is a disease without a cause mentioned in your Bible. It's called the disease without cause. But uh, here is one of the main problems that we don't look at in our way of eating that is contributed to the cancer. If a farmer has a cow and it has a calf and the calf is nursing from the cow or mother and let's say the other is bruised by the lip of the calf, allowing blood to seep through with the milk, what would the farmer do? 
Take the calf and nurse them the right. Oh, right. He will stop the nursing of the calf from the mother. Okay. In biblical times, if you're a very orthodox Jew, and it comes down to known as a kosher law of preparing food, you don't mix a milk product with a meat product. Now, every rabbi knows that. And every uh, kosher place knows that. Every farmer knows you don't allow the milk to mix with the blood. But we who look at that need something more specific, otherwise we're going to end up becoming dogmatic in it. What's the specific? Is Before I go to the specific, i show you what we're doing in our own society. We will take that cow milk it and out of the milk we'll make cheese then we will clobber the cow and make hamburger <laughs> we'll gather the grain out of the barn and make bread and we put the hamburger on top of the bread and put the cheese on top of the hamburger and melt it wow. and then we call it cheeseburger <laughs> It's a very nice meal, and after all, it's healthy as far as a starving person is concerned. <laughs> but in the chemical relationship, as far as a kosher person who is following kosher eating, he wouldn't touch it. That's meat, and that's dairy product. As far as a farmer who sees that, it's okay for his child to eat, but not his calf. <laughs> <laughs> but we who are looking at it objectively now see the reason behind it. The lactic acid from the milk does not bond with the hemoglobin of the blood. They are antagonistic forces, thus causing a tremendous drop in nitrogen in the mechanism that is necessary to keep the trophoblast cells sleeping because you have them from head to foot. They're one of the cells in the formation of the body that shuts off and goes to sleep when the baby is born. But they'll wake up if the nitrogen content drops below a certain level that keeps them sleeping. If the nitrogen level is kept at the safe level value, that the body is organized for them to stay at and sleep, they will not wake up. But this now starts to make them drop down. Plus, if you eat protein minus nitrogen, it also forces them to wake up. And when they wake up, because the nitrogen content has gone down, that will keep them sleeping, they feed on protein Every living creature feeds on protein to grow. But they don't feed on protein with nitrogen. They feed on protein minus nitrogen. All waste products of the human body is protein minus nitrogen. That's how they spread so fast. And that's why it becomes so difficult to control it. Now, Dr. Horevsky, who uses in his research, not too long ago in the last four years, the combination of platinum and chlorine made a solution known as platinum chloride that can actually inhibit the function of the trophoblast cell that becomes cancerous and put it back to sleep or suspend it down to a non-malignant behavior, has found there are only two times in a day that this injection of his works and doesn't work. If he administers the injection before 11 o'clock in the morning, the patient recovers and go home and they don't have the, the cancer condition in the body. But if the patient is administered the injection after midday, they die next day 
with pneumonia of the lungs. All the death records of those that died show that from the time it was administered versus those that were alive and went home. Then he began to experiment because he wanted wives. Some were living and some were dying. He began to take rats now and test it. And the conclusiveness is that the time was vital in the administration. So anytime a nurse is given the instruction for a certain type of cancer in the body requiring platinum fluoride to be used, she has to inject it before midday, usually at spleen time, that is between 9 and 11. This is the injected there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you more? Yeah. Uh,